you ran into Gnosticism, Gnostics denied the goodness of material creation and they denied that the creator was therefore good. And if creation isn't a good thing, salvation isn't going to look like the salvation of creation. It's going to look more like salvation from creation. It's going to look more like the matrix where the point is to transcend creation. How? How do you transcend creation? How do you, how do you escape your own circumstances? Gnostics answered that it is with knowledge that we transcend our circumstances, that we escape our slavery to material creation. Just knowing that the material world isn't all there is can help. And knowing especially that you don't really belong here in this material world. This world is not your home. That can help begin to point people out of the matrix. Intellectually transcending your, uh, the world's appearances and achieving mastery over that material realm so that it no longer masters us. That was an appealing vision to Platonists in the first few centuries who thought more or less the same thing about the relationship between the physical world and, and its source, its God. And that mindset became very influential in some sectors of the church in, say, the second and third centuries. Christian, if you like, Gnosticism. Valentinus was a, a, a Gnostic leader. They had a label for, for different kinds of people. The top level were spiritual, the middle level were soulish, and the bottom level were physical. And you didn't bother with the physical ones because they were just copper tops. They, they were irredeemable. The soulish ones you could teach, and Jesus would teach them with his public teaching. When Jesus gave knowledge to the crowds, those were hints and glimpses of the reality. But then with a chosen inner circle of disciples, the spiritual ones, Peter, James, John, Jesus, spread secret information that clearly laid out the true knowledge by which we can master and transcend creation. So Morpheus and Neo and the like Trinity, they, they don't go blabbing about all this stuff out there. They wait until they find a particular person who's receptive to it, who's ready to hear it. That's mirroring Jesus' technique of, he has 12, but he has three inner disciples that he works uh, in special ways with. He's got an inner circle. And in the Gospels, he does. Peter, James, and John are more insiders than the others. They're the ones up on the mountain at the Transfiguration, but they're not receiving teaching that the others aren't. They're not being given a different or a deeper picture of the kingdom than the others. Let me show you Acts 8. There was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and he amazed the nation of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. You can already get a sense of a character issue that'll play out. They all gave heed to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is that power of God that is called great. And that's a kind of crazy sentence. This man is that power of God that is called great. Sounds kind of like Morpheus or the architect or one of these people who issues cryptic metaphysical statements that don't make that much sense if you're sober. <laughs> And they gave heed to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now that's great. The magician is amazed by what he sees happening around him in the apostles. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had revealed the word of, uh, received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down. It's kind of like, you know, what, Samaria? Really? You better check them out. So Peter and John, 
who know the real thing, they go and check out what's going on in Samaria. Because, uh, and they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now maybe that looks Pentecostal to you, or maybe the laying on of hands makes it look kind of Catholic to you. Anyway, Peter and John lay their hands on the believers and they receive the Holy Spirit that belongs with faith and belongs with baptism. Now, in verse 18, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what Michael Shermer would call magical thinking, isn't it? He's like, wow, look at that. That's a great trick. Can I be your apprentice? And can I learn that trick? That's how magicians think, right? You go to Hogwarts, you put in your time, you learn the technique, and you achieve power and mastery that you don't have early on in your first year when you're blowing up feathers and, and such. <laughs> Simon's still thinking with his old plausibility structures about what he's seen. He's, he's seen the gospel, but he's reinterpreted the gospel according to his categories. He thinks salvation is a technique, as a form of knowledge. But Peter said to him, your silver perish with you. It's not the most pastoral phrase in the New Testament. <laughs> because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible... Your heart's intent may be forgiven you. For I see that you're in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. He actually looks through the request to the spirit that generates that kind of request and says, here's the issue. Repent of your need to be able to manipulate the gift of God. And what does Simon do? He still doesn't really get it in the last line here of the exchange. He answered, you pray for me that what you've said won't happen. You pray for me. You, you got the whole jiu-jitsu Holy Spirit trick. You do it. Like he doesn't get that. That's open to him too. It's open to anyone. We don't know what happens to Simon. He drops out of the story. Maybe he repented. It doesn't sound like it because we probably would have heard more about him from the story, but we don't know what happened. Simon's not the first Gnostic, but Christian tradition calls Simon the magician the father of Gnosticism. He thinks like a Gnostic. And Peter's rejection of him describes the spirit as a gift. You don't, you don't generate a gift, you don't master a gift, you just receive it. It's not knowledge that gathers the church, it's not technique that gathers the church. God gathers the church. And the spirit is the gift through whom God gathers the church. I see traces of Gnostic thinking today because this isn't ancient history, we keep making similar mistakes. I want to show you two things and ask you whether these look a little Gnostic. The first one is a reliance in some church circles on formulas and techniques to produce results. Maybe an evangelistic technique that's ordered towards getting a person to say the sinner's prayer. And what is the sinner's prayer? It's, Jesus, I accept you as Lord and personal Savior. And you need to say Lord and personal Savior. You can't just say Lord. Lord and personal Savior. Not just Savior, not the world's Savior, personal Savior, my Savior. If you get all the elements in this this uh, formula, then you can know that you've been saved. Now, I don't have a problem with the sinner's prayer. I don't have a problem with that language. But in some circles, that language is, is normative, right? It's canonical. You're really not allowed to deviate from that language. And um, and you're really not allowed to know that you're saved until you've said it. And, and mission comes down to getting people to say it. 
you might even structure the whole, the whole effort around producing the conditions for people to say it. The right sequence of teachings, the right final night campfire, worship band, inspirational speaker, whatever, creating the conditions for this to happen. I'm not saying that is Gnosticism, but I think that kind of thinking can easily confuse people into thinking that it's the technique that saves. That the power is in the technique or the power is in the words, not the good news. I heard a story from a colleague of mine when I was teaching at Azusa Pacific who, uh, he and his theologian friends were um, at the airport after a theology conference. The waitress is, is attending to them and asks, so what, why were you in town? It's an airport, so of course that's the perfect leading question. Oh, we were here for a conference. Oh, what kind of conference? A oh, religious conference. Religious scholars conference. Oh, what kind of religious scholars? What do we teach theology? Oh, what, what kind of theology? She's zeroing in. She's <laughs> circling her prey. Um, and well, we're Christian theologians. And she says, oh, oh, have you been born again? Which I think is great. You know, people ought to take those risks, and she does. And so no, no discredit to her at all. Have you been born again? And so my colleague who teaches theology says, we've drunk of the living water. And she's like, have you been born again? <laughs> we've drunk of the living water. And she's like, why won't you tell me whether you're born again? And he says, I am. I'm just using the metaphor of John 4 instead of the metaphor of John 3. <laughs> what a geek, right? But um, here's my point, and here's why this is funny. She couldn't hear it in John 4. It, John 4 wasn't good enough. It had to be John 3. We can turn our standards into formulas and our formulas into little laws and our laws into masterable techniques. And I think we're flirting with Gnosticism when we do. Another, another Gnostic feeling trait in the church, there are, are significant portions of the church that think that the world needs to be a better place, and you know they're right. But the way to make the world a better place is to put into practice a set of policies, techniques, that will produce justice, or freedom, or prosperity. If we do the right things, the right techniques, in a, in a, in a rule of techniques, a technocracy, then we can create the conditions for goodness in the world. I mean, I, I think that's the American way. Every four years, we pick which one's going to be better at bringing justice and prosperity and freedom through this platform or that platform. And when our whole vision of the meaning of life comes to surround that project, how is that not Gnosticism? How does that not reduce salvation to the implementation of a set of techniques to produce a given result? I think in some ways we live in an age that is powerfully Gnostic. It trains us to master the creation so that we can, so that we can transcend its limits. The elites that need to make America good again um, their secret knowledge is mediated through PhD programs and you know elite institutions, but it's still secret. It's still it's still elite knowledge. Now, mind you, I'm I'm all for wise and intelligent policies, and I'm all for. Um, I mean, we send our we send our kids to Bible camp when they're when they're willing to go, and I don't, I don't think I don't think that retreats. I don't think that programs. I don't think that things like that are inevitably. Gnostic or inevitably bad, but they can be confusing if you don't know where the real power lies.